Hey, everybody. Hey, everyone. Uh, I think that's the first time I've ever been introduced with the theme song from an 80s sitcom. That's amazing. Does anybody know what that song was? So when, when Adam asked earlier, what was it? Modern, Modern Family, Family, Full House, or This Is Us. This is us. Who chose Full House? Woo! Oh, a couple. Who chose Modern Family? Woo! This Is Us? Who didn't choose anything? Who has no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> Great, awesome, great start. Okay, hey, my name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here. And you know, whether you are uh, watching us right now on Facebook Live, whether you're in the room with us right here and now, or maybe you're watching a little bit later on on our YouTube channel, or maybe you're even listening to this days, weeks, months, years from now on our podcast, we are so glad that you're part of the MP Knights family tonight. Now, I just want to kick off with a quick confession. The confession is this. I have never felt less qualified to give a message than I do right now. And that's not... <laughs> that's awesome. And that's not because, you know... Mal and Adam are sitting here and they're just such gifted communicators, right? Amen? I actually feel super unqualified for this because you guys are in the middle of a series called Perfect Families. And I came from a family that was anything but perfect. In fact, it would be better if this series for me was called Confusing Families. (laughs) See, I was... I come from a family where um, my mom was married, has been married three times. Her first marriage happened before I was born, and in that marriage, she had three kids. She had two girls, who I know as my sisters, and then she had a boy who she gave away at birth, adopted out at birth, and who I didn't meet until I was about you know, 20, 21 years old. In her second marriage, she had two children, my brother, and myself. But when I was about six years old, she got remarried to my stepdad. For the third, that was a third marriage. And then my biological father, he has had multiple kids through multiple women, more than I could possibly ever count. So my family is pretty confusing. Now, let me just say this. I had so many great times with my family. I had growing up, I had so many great times with my brothers and my sisters, but my family was confusing. While most of the other families around me that I knew growing up had Kodak moments, my family had Prozac moments. (laughs) It was confusing. But there came a point when I was in my late teens, early 20s, when I started to graduate out of my family of origin, and I met my wife, Meg, and together we created three amazing daughters, and I moved to this point of having a family that, while it's not perfect, it's pretty good. You know what I mean? So I graduated out of that. But when I was going into this phase of life, what I realized pretty quickly was that I needed some very heavy-duty counseling to deal with some of the dysfunction that I had grown up with. I remember the very first time that I went to get counseling. I walked into my therapist, and one of the first questions they asked me was, does anybody in your family suffer from mental illness? And I said, no, they all seem to enjoy it. Since then, I've seen a handful of counselors, uh, especially in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, One that really stands out, though. It was about eight years ago, and I went to see a counselor because uh, my family of origin was starting to intrude a little bit into my wife and my, my immediate family of my wife and my three kids. And so I went and saw this counselor, and one of the first sessions, He talked to me about this book by Dr. Henry Cloud called Boundaries. Great book. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. I went away and I read that book, like started it that night. I think I finished in like a day and a half. It was absolutely incredible. And I started to apply some of the things that I had learned in that book. I literally started setting boundaries around my family of origin. I remember contacting my parents and letting them know, hey, 
I'm going through some counseling and I'm going to be setting up some boundaries so that I can have some space away from you guys so that I can work on my immediate family. They responded pretty well. They sent me an email back questioning my faith, saying that they didn't think that I was even a Christian anymore because I was breaking the fifth commandment. Just as a revision, the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. And they said that I was not following that. And if I wasn't following that, then I couldn't be a Christian. I remember the next day or so, I went out to my counselor's office. My therapist sat me down. He said, how's everything going? And I told him the story. I told him what my parents had said. And his response was, pretty interesting and pretty blunt. He looked at me and he said, you know that's bullshit, right? I'm quoting him, okay? <laughs> that's what he said. And I remember being taken aback. This was a Christian counselor. And I wondered what he meant by that. And what he said was that boundaries gave me the opportunity to honor my parents because it would mean that I would maintain some sort of relationship with them. That by setting up boundaries, I was actually honoring them because I, was, I would be able to maintain some sort of relationship with them. Then he went on to explain to me what the boundaries might look like. He said, sometimes in my relationship with my family of origin, my boundary might look like this, a white picket fence. It would be a boundary that would mark my territory around my immediate family, but it would allow me to have conversations and a relationship with my parents over that fence. Does that make sense? So he said, sometimes you might need a white picket fence. But then he said, sometimes your fence might look like this. <laughs> he said, sometimes it might be a 12 foot high wire fence with barbed wire at the, at the top. Now this fence says, you can still have communication with me. You can still check out my photos on Facebook but my immediate family is a no-fly zone. You cannot go anywhere near them. And he was right. Sometimes I've had to use that boundary. And then he said, in other seasons of life, the boundary might look like this. He said it might be an 18-foot-high concrete wall. He said it might be a great, great wall, the greatest of walls, the best wall, I might say to protect my southern border. He didn't say who was going to pay for it, <laughs> but he said that sometimes I might need an 18-foot high concrete wall with barbed wire at the top and one door, and the only door handle was on my side of the fence, on my side of the wall. And you know what? If I'm, I'm, if I'm super authentic and super honest with you, right now in my family of origin, this is actually the wall that we have in place. That's just where things are at, at the moment. Now, I understand that, you know, for you guys here, not everybody in the room would, uh, would relate to my story. Not everybody here has had the same experience that I had growing up. Maybe you don't relate at all. Maybe you don't relate at all because you get along really, really well with your parents. Maybe you're actually from a perfect family. And if that's you tonight, that's awesome. I wish I was you. <laughs> you should get up here and start giving the message, right? So maybe you come from this perfect family. In fact, maybe things are going so great for you in your family of origin that you're not, you're not even thinking about leaving, like ever. In fact, Maybe in your family of origin, the only people talking about boundaries are your parents. I'm sure some of them are sitting at home right now and they're scared that they're going to be paying for your car insurance for the rest of their life. <laughs> or worse, the rest of your life. <laughs> See, there comes a point as emerging adults where we have to actually lean into the adult part and less into the emerging part. And we have to stand up, put some pants on, and start making our way in the world today, right? Now, in some cultures, they call this growing up. 
In some other cultures, they call it responsibility, taking responsibility. I think in our culture, what we call it is adulting. (laughs) We call it adulting. It's something we all need to do, but it's sometimes it's hard to do, right? Let's be honest. Sometimes it's hard to graduate out of our family of origin and start adulting. But here's the great news. There's actually help for this. The New York Post did an article a few months ago where they said that there's a company in Portland, Maine that had started the adulting school for millennials. True story. Now you can go to adulting school. Yes, really. Now, I want to start by saying that I think this is extremely unfair that emerging adults, that millennials, get branded with this sort of thing, get targeted for this sort of thing. I think that is so unfair because I want this as well. (laughs) And I'm not in your age group, but I really want this. See, what this course does, this course has classes on doing your taxes, classes on how to cook, setting up a 401k. It has classes on setting up health insurance. And these are all things that I struggle with still to this day. Actually, true story, I went to their website this week and tried to sign up, and they didn't let me. (laughs) I'm not going to lie, a little bit bummed about it. So here's what I want to do. I want to take like maybe two minutes. I want you to talk amongst yourselves, um, amongst the people who are around you. I want you to answer this question. What would you like to study if you went to an adulting school. Now, if you're watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube, what I want you to do is I want you to actually type a comment out in the comment section because we're going to have somebody follow up with you later on. We just want to get everybody interacting, okay? So take two minutes right now. What class would you take at an adulting school? Go. Let's go. All right. All right, here we go. I want somebody to shout out some answers. Let's go. I just heard one retirement planning, like 401k stuff. She, what was that? Finances, that's good. That's a great one. Anybody else? Starting a business. business. Wow, that's a big adulting thing. Stocks. Yeah, I want to know about stocks as well. Does anybody know about stocks in the room? All right, this is the guy. A couple people to come and see. Anybody else? This side. What class would you study? Building credit. credit. That's a good one. These are very... Look at all the people nodding going, oh, yeah, credit. (laughs) credit. I get it. That's so good. That's so good. Paying off debt. That's a great one. It's easy. Just pay. Work-life balance. Who said that? Work-life balance. Work-life balance is a myth. That's a whole other message. We can talk about that later. Hey, so here's the thing. So there's this adulting school that started again. I literally tried to get in, and they didn't let me take any classes, which was annoying. Um, But here's the funny thing, right? It ends up that the joke is on the older generation when it comes to this school. Because the New York Post did a follow-up article a little bit later on that blames the school on parents. The headline read, this is true, Adults in classes prove millennials' nitwit parents are to blame. That's a great headline right there, yeah? And, and if you read the article, the article goes on to say, this was like March this year, the article goes on to say that the reason millennials' nitwit parents who are at home right now stressed and trying to set up an 18-foot-high concrete wall, the reason they're to blame is because the article says they're they're guilty of wrapping their children in bubble wrap. (laughs) That's why they're to blame. I think that that's true. But that aside, let's be honest here. We all have to, at some point, leave the nest. We all, at some point, have to graduate out of our family of origin and start working out retirement plans, credit, work-life balance, starting businesses, stocks on our own, right? We all have to graduate from our family of origin and start doing that sort of thing. It's an important part of our growth. It's an important part of our life. And this is a process that family psychologists would say is totally necessary for all of us. It's necessary of any healthy family. And in fact, they would draw it out. They would draw it like this. 
Is that green or white? Okay, I'm colorblind, so I can't tell. That's the thing I would learn at the adulting school, how to tell colors. So most uh, family psychologists, they would draw out what a healthy family looks like by doing this. They would say that in any healthy family, there's an adult... I'm just, <laughs> spelling would be my next one. So in any healthy family, they would say that there's an adult, right? And that adult is taking care of a child. Now by that, what, what they would say is that adult is overseeing, that adult is caring for that child from a position of authority, okay? Now then they would say that in a dysfunctional family setup, in a dysfunctional family, in an unhealthy family, there would be a child who, for whatever reason, maybe it's the, the psychological issues of the parent, maybe it's, it's um, you know, uh, a whole bunch of family baggage, they have to take on the role of being the adult. They, they have to take on the role of being the parent. That's what I meant. So do you, do you get what I'm saying? The whole thing shifts, the whole thing changes when the child has to take on the role of being the parent, either parenting themselves or in some situations parenting the parent, yeah? Now, I'm not talking about a situation where there's a family illness or something like that and, and a child has to become a caregiver. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a psychological dysfunctional situation where a child is forced to move into this role of being a parent. Now, this is obviously not the goal of a family. What family psychologists would say is actually the goal is that a child who's being looked after and cared for by a parent, actually grows up to become an adult. That is the goal of a healthy family. And here's the interesting thing. When that happens, and it happens normally, and it happens well, the parent takes on the role, moves out of a position of authority over the parent, and becomes like a peer to their child, an adult peer to their child. Does that make sense? Now, in some cultures, this place right here, where all the lines intersect, this is what some cultures would call a rite of passage. And certain cultures have a number of different ways to mark this rite of passage of a child becoming an adult and moving into this relationship, this healthy relationship, this functional relationship, where the parent and the child are both adults and they operate together as adults. Now, this is a healthy situation. So I wonder, as I'm drawing all of this out, where are you seeing yourself? This is a rhetorical question. Where are you seeing yourself, I wonder, in this story, in this idea? For my wife, Meg, and I, this is a goal of ours. This is what we're working towards. We have three daughters. 13, 14, and 17. Ugh. Please pray for us. Three, three teenage girls, pray for us. But we always tell our teenage girls, we are not raising teenage girls, we are raising adult women. And so we are giving them responsibilities that are age appropriate to help move them from the place of being a child to being an adult so that we can have this sort of relationship with them. Now, the interesting thing is that we see all of this in the life of Jesus. It all plays out in his life as well. See, one of Jesus' first followers named Luke, after about 10, 20, 30 years after Jesus had gone, Luke set out to investigate Jesus' life and tell a detailed account of his story. And in, he, he wrote it all down in a book which he conveniently named the book of Luke, um, so that we would know who wrote it. And in chapter 2 of that book, he writes this. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. Now, we know a couple of things from this one verse. We know that Jesus was in Jerusalem. We know it was Passover. And we know he was 12 years old. But we also know that there was something happen happening according to the custom. See, the custom that is being spoken about here is a custom that was very prevalent in the Jewish culture. 
of the time. See, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was a boy, there was a rite of passage that boys 12 years old, 13 years old would go through. They would go to Jerusalem for the Passover, and it was their responsibility to sacrifice the lamb for the family for Passover. This is the custom that Luke is talking about. This was Jesus' rite of passage. Does this make sense? So this is what was happening in this story. Jesus was becoming a man through this custom. So let's pick up the story. It continues with, After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it, thinking he was in their company. They traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Now, at this point, everybody in the story is freaking out, right? Everybody's in a panic. I mean, it's not like Joseph just misplaced his car keys. It's not like Mary couldn't find her phone. They lost a human being, okay? So they rush back to Jerusalem, and then we pick it up. After three days... They found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. We track him? Okay. Everyone who heard him, Jesus, was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. Story goes on. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for him. And then Jesus' response is pretty cool. He he says something really interesting. He says this. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Now that's interesting because Jesus had just been through this rite of passage, right? He was moving from being a boy to being a man. So in his mind, he was now an adult. He was now a man. And so he started to take on some responsibilities for himself. We even see that in the way that he spoke to his parents, right? His parents come in and say, what's going on? Why did you leave us? And he responds in a very adult way. Well, why were you searching for me? I, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? He didn't do something that was age appropriate of a 12-year-old. He didn't say, I'm so sorry I lost track of time. I'm so sorry the battery on my cell phone ran out. He didn't say that sort of stuff. He starts treating them like adults. He starts having a peer-to-peer relationship with them. And that's because he understood that he was no longer a boy culturally. He was becoming a man. And as a man, he was starting to pursue, starting to chase after the future that he had already planned for. As far as Jesus was concerned in that moment, he was right where he needed to be. He was getting started with his future in his father's house. He was becoming a healthy adult. You see that? And this is the goal of all of us when we're growing up. And it's the goal of all of us who are parents. We want to see our kids move from being children to being adults. And it's funny, in the Jesus story, we see the benefits of this process that he's going through. At the end of chapter 2, just like a couple of verses away, it says this, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. You see, even at the age of 12, Jesus understood this idea. He understood that the first step to living the life you want is leaving the life you had. The very first step to living the life that you want is leaving the life that you had. Now, maybe today you are thinking of your family of origin as you look at this and you're realizing that you're in a dysfunctional family. Maybe you already knew that. Maybe you know that your family situation is not healthy. Maybe you've been forced to play the child role. Sorry, you were forced to, as a child, you were forced to play the parent role. And maybe you're still facing that right now. If that's you tonight, then I really believe you need to start working through the idea of setting up some boundaries so that you can become a healthy adult. Now, in all honesty, that might require some counseling. But you know what? That's okay. Because you, you don't get counseling because you're broken. You get counseling because you're breathing. It's okay 
to get counseling. Now, perhaps you're sitting here today and you're thinking, you know what, I'm in a family where I am being still treated like a child. Or maybe, maybe you're taking on the role of being a child. How do you know that? Well, if you've got a full-time job and your parents are still paying your car insurance, you're acting like a child. If you have a full-time job and your parents are still covering your phone bill, maybe it's time that you took on some more responsibility. Maybe it's time that you take on some responsibility and graduate out of your family of origin. Maybe it's tonight is the night that you realize that the first step to living the life you want is leaving the life that you had. Or are you... There's this great saying that Andy has, right? You've probably heard him say it a, a couple of times. He says, are you the person the person you're looking for is looking for? Are you the person the person you're looking for is looking for? Well, unless you're looking for somebody with a truckload of family baggage, maybe things need to sh shift. Unless you're looking for a person who's still having their bills paid by their parents even though you have a full-time job, then maybe it's time to grow up. Maybe it's time to leave the nest. Maybe it's time to graduate out of your family of origin. Maybe tonight is the night that you start taking some responsibility. You know, next week, Mal and Adam are going to be speaking about creating a better family. They're going to be interviewing John and Debbie Woodall. I would encourage you to be here. It's going to be amazing. The Woodalls are an amazing couple. They've got so much wisdom, and I know they're going to pour out onto you guys in a huge way about what it means to create a better family. That's going to be awesome. But not to steal their thunder, I kind of want to start next week's message now. <laughs> because creating a better family starts when you graduate out of your family of origin that you're currently in. Creating a better family starts now. You know, I'm a big believer that for everybody in this room, the best is yet to come. But, this, but the best starts right now. When you take the first step towards living the life you want by leaving the life that you had. You know, this is an idea, this is a principle that has worked for me in my life. I graduated out of my family of origin. I put systems and boundaries in place that allowed me to have relationship with them. I've got fantastic relationships with all of my brothers and sisters. But that only happened when I got to the point of realizing that the first step to living the life I wanted was to leave the life that I had. So I wonder tonight, what action step can you take this week to graduate to adulting? What is the step that you can take this week to graduate to adulting? This is something that I would love for all of you to talk about in your small groups during the week. I don't want this to be rhetorical. If you're watching on Facebook Live or if you're watching on YouTube now, write that, comp write that question down and write an answer in the comment section. But I would love all of us to be thinking about this question during the week. What action step can you take this week to graduate to adulting? In fact